This is the Content and AI Podcast, episode number 20. A false dichotomy has arisen in the AI world between conversational prompting and chatbot interfaces and prompt engineering under the hood. Micah Kronebega works in the middle ground in a role she calls prompt design. She also draws on practices from her background in technical communication after observing that whether you're writing for humans or designing prompts for LLMs, you have to truly understand your audience and always provide clear and specific instructions. Welcome to the Content and AI Podcast, where experts on artificial intelligence share their wisdom with the content community. Our mission is to demystify and democratize AI, to make its principles and practices accessible to all content practitioners. And now here's your host, Larry Swanson. Hey everyone, welcome to episode number 20 of the Content and AI Podcast. I am super delighted today to welcome to the show, Micah Kronoweke. Uh, Micah is, um, well, she's a principal at uh, ConvoCat, her company, uh, and she's an actual genuine prompt engineer. So Micah, welcome. Tell the folks some more uh, about what it's like being a prompt engineer at ConvoCat. Thank you so much for having me, Larry. And it's such a pleasure to be here with you. And yes, I guess that I can say that for the last two years, I've been working as a prompt engineer or perhaps rather a prompt designer. And when I tell people that they're, they're all going like, oh, that must be really sexy and it's the job of the future. Whereas in reality, I basically write instructions for large language models. And um, I guess I wouldn't really associate it with being sexy because most of this is very much like getting your feet in the dirt kind of work, you know, Excel sheets, lots of analysis, lots of document analysis and content analysis. Um, and I guess it's basically a job for, well, can I call them language nerds like you and me? <laughs> so yeah, right now I'm working for a large um, Dutch publisher uh, and I help them kind of finding out what kind of work we can automate by prompting. Uh, and it's really interesting. But I've also worked in uh, situations like hyper automation, where the prompts are not the prompts that you write in ChatGPT, but they are part of a larger workflow. For instance, a workflow where you receive an email, you want to have like a first suggestion for an answer, you generate that text, you put it in an email again, or perhaps in a phone call. So it's not really visible, but it's definitely there in the background. Oh, interesting. Yeah, well, you've done so much. I guess first, let me, can you do a sort of a quick job description for what a prompt Absolutely. engineer does? Like you just outlined the main duties, like the yeah, main things yeah. are But what does that look like day to day? Like what's your what's your new job? My, my new job, and it's it's so funny because it's actually my old job. Uh, I, I feel I'm back to technical writing and technical communication again, because in order to write a good prompt for a machine, I actually apply the same principles that I use for prompting humans, instruction design. Um, so basically, let's let's take a situation, like a real life situation. This is not from my, my actual client, but it was um, an assignment I once got, and it came from a developer. It's um, He's quite well known in the space, and he's like, Micah, listen, I need... Um, to prompt a newsletter or a one pager for three different audiences. And it should be based on two or three articles from, you know, from the news, from actual news about LLMs and machine learning. And he's like, well, I prompted it. And I must say that the output is kind of meh. And I looked at this prompt. It was literally like, hey, generate a newsletter. I'm like, well, when I would tell a junior editor to create a newsletter, I would give him more instructions. I would give him tell. Uh, I would tell him something about my target audience. Who is it for? What are their information needs? What is their level of expertise? Because you know, technical writing one hundred and one. Don't write for your own level of understanding, but make sure you understand your target audience. So it was so funny because prompt engineering is positioned as a rather technical job sometimes, or a very kind of marketing job. But my job is right in the middle. So what I do is I do a lot of domain analysis. I need to know who I'm working for. And in order to determine the information need of my target audience, I, of course, need to know a little bit of what they're doing. 
Um, I do target, uh, uh, target audience analysis, user task analysis, all kinds of stuff. And then when I write my prompt, I do find I write it in the form of a traditional instruction. And that, of course, is one. I've been doing that for 25 years. So it's almost like being full circle back into the place I, I never left in the first place. Because even as a conversation designer, I still feel very much kind of at heart, I'm always a technical writer. Because I always support users in, you know, completing their tasks successfully or answering questions, solving problems. And these are just new incarnations, I guess, of that job. You know, as, as you talk about your background and where you are now, I'm reminded that like everybody in content design, conversation design, technical writing, I mean, technical writing seems to be like, that's the most straightforward one. People often study that in college and then go actually do it. But everybody else, the conversation designers and content designers and UX writers I know, they all come from like some crazy amalgam of, of careers and, and backgrounds. <laughs> um, and in your case, it just seems like the perfect storm of uh, that technical writing plus conversation design. And I guess, tell me, because you, you mm -hmm. first came to my attention a few years ago as like a, like a really prominent and well-known and well-regarded and super helpful content and conversation designer. Um, and these these new agents we're working with, the chatbots and GPTs mm -hmm. and all that stuff, they're all conversationally based things. How do, do you feel like, does, does my idea that like you're mm -hmm. the like perfectly positioned for that, does that resonate is, or did you feel like this has just come really naturally or? Yes. Um, and it's, it's interesting because when I started as a technical writer, I wasn't even aware that that was a formal job. It was in the early 2000s. So little trip down memory lane. It was the time of a uh, news group called Tech Row, um, and where people like me gathered. And I was what we called the lone technical writer at the company. So I basically invented my own job. And I found that I, I just got really fascinated, especially by how people ask their questions. I also spent some time at the help desk at the same company where I started as a tech writer. And the way people ask questions, it can be so completely different from what you think they want to do. And that's what kind of started to fascinate me throughout my career. And with conversation design, 20 years later, I felt like I had won the lottery because in, for the first time, we got our user questions handed to us on a, a silver plate. Because especially if you create a chatbot with natural language understanding, you get the literal questions from your users. And this, of course, is a technical writer well, I was lucky. I spent 14 years with air traffic control. So I sat next to my target audience, literally in the tower and behind the radar screens. But in many uh, other situations, I didn't have access to my target audience. So I was trying to help them, but I didn't know who they were and what kind of context they worked. And all of a sudden, here I am with hundreds, thousands of user questions for me to analyze and to kind of turn into answers, turn into user support, turn into task-based um, yeah, user assistance. And of course, now with generative AI, it's a bit different because it's even better at question recognition than traditional chatbots. But all of a sudden, people are also starting to talk about generating the answers rather than having them written by humans. And of course, that's something to be aware of. And that's also why I wanted to kind of get involved with prompt engineering, uh, because I thought, well, <laughs> if someone needs to teach these things how to talk, um, it should be someone who knows to do that herself. But also, I wanted to prove them wrong. Like, hey, listen, this generated content, it might look really like surprising and magical the first time you see it appearing on the screen magically. But when you start actually reading what it produces, you'll find that time and again, it not just hallucinates, but it's not very language oriented. It doesn't have a soul. There's no voice in there. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, um, it's good to have someone who's both a writer and critical and in love with the technology, all three of them, 
in one person. And let's see where this, this goes. Yeah. As you're talking, you're reminding me that so many people have talked about, like I've talked to Scott Abel and, and uh, Sarah mm -hmm. O'Keefe and a number of people in the technical content world about this stuff. They say, they often make the case that like in technical communication, especially customer support, like help desk kinds of things, the last thing you want is an LLM because they're so prone to hallucination. But but more to the point, not even if it's hallucination, mm -hmm. but just that they don't always get the facts exactly yeah. right. And if you're trying to fix your your machine that they're they're documenting um tell me how so but your role as a prompt engineer it sounds like you're in there doing this and and, and creating these kinds of things yeah. are you able to get these because it, the other instead of hallucination you might say they're just creative <laughs> you know to get these new creative writers that are on the team now um how do you help the llms um, answer those questions in a way, or, or you know, do the the the, the create conversations that are actually mm -hmm. productive, and they mm -hmm. aren't just like creatively making stuff up. Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting because <clears throat> the one thing I don't do as a prompt designer right now is actually creating chatbots or conversational experiences because my prompts are usually like what we call single shot prompts. I give an instruction and it outputs something, and that goes into uh, a workflow as input for another step. But um, what I do find, because of course I have been experimenting in my own time with chatbots, uh, is that retrieval augmented generation, if your content set is good, um, it will actually give you quite a nice base to start from. But we've also seen what happens if you just leave it at that. There have been some examples in the media lately uh, of some chatbots who were LLM based and not well designed uh, without any guardrails. So um, that can go terribly wrong. So can we use LLMs as the core technology of our customer support chatbots? No. Also because people are not really, at least that's my opinion, <laughs> I don't think people are really helped by having conversations. People are helped by solving their problems. So having a conversational mm. chatbot for me is only a, a transitory stage on the way to real transactional chatbots that have access to all kinds of backend systems where you can self-service and solve your problems. And only when your problem is too complex and too personal, well, then you shouldn't be talking to a chatbot in the first place. You should be handed over to a human, like regardless, right? Because People are not stupid. They've usually read the website. They've read the FAQs. Um, so, yeah. But having sat, said, said, sorry about my English today, it's after five. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, I, I, do, I do feel that this retrieval augmented generation, which we also know as talk to your dog. Um, again, if your content set is good, um, it can greatly reduce hallucinations. Uh, which leaves you with another challenge because hallucinations are quite obvious. It's it's usually quite easy to tell unless you can't because there are also hallucinations that are not nonsense that are slight modifications of the actual text in the documentation, which, for instance, when you have two facts which each individually are true, but if you combine them, might still contradict each other. And that is mm. something that really depends on the quality of your source content. And I think that's where we are in familiar territory again, because what makes good source content? Good. And you probably wrote some of that, right? Or, or, or could easily have written those those yeah. technical content source documents yeah. that you're referring to. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that workflow, because the way you just described that, there's the, the, the benefits of the way these new LLMs work yeah, you're, and RAG mm -hmm. is just kind of putting those knowledge bases into that flow. How does yeah. that work? Is it like, is is the learning model actually learning from that corpus of material that you're drawing on, or is it just referring to it as a no, it, as a source material? That that the the, the last is um, is what's happening with a retrieval augmented generation. Although the boundaries are blurring a bit because large language models now all of a sudden ha sudden have these quite big context windows, which means that you can upload a lot of information directly to the context of your conversation, but that's quite technical. But if you look at traditional RAG, where you say talk to a large document or a set of documents, basically what happens is these documents, they need to be chunked. And chunking, of course, is another familiar term, term for us as technical communicators. 
These chunks are encoded into what we call embeddings or vector embeddings. So those are like numerical representations of word distances. It's quite technical, but there's no full text in the large language model. Basically what you do is you allow to the large language model to retrieve relevant information from these doc and documents and use it as context to generate an answer. And the better your context, so the more specific your context, the more consistent your context, and in, in, instead of context, you can also read content, the better the answer is going to be. So if you want to reduce your hallucinations with RAG, you have to make sure that your source content is chunkable. So each chunk should ideally be a self-contained unit that doesn't refer to other units for cohesion coherence. It should be small enough to fit in a chunk for RAG. It should be well-structured. <laughs> and this is technical writing 101. <laughs> and I am very curious, and I think that um, Michael Jantoska and um, I think perhaps even Scott um, might have already been experimenting with this. What happens if you take some of our traditional structured formats like DITA, and feed them into a RAG system. I'm not quite aware um, if anyone has tried this and shared the results yet, but it might be a very interesting thing to do. Because another thing that LLMs absolutely love is structure. And if you just feed it an XML schema, it will just say, oh, looks like an XML schema. That's cool, I can do that. Right, and then it can write queries against that schema. Uh, and then you're you're off and running and that's where, it, that's something it is good at. but. Um, but back to that, back to that, mm -hmm. because the way you describe chunking and chunks, that sounds like structured content. And but it, so how does that manifest in like um, LLM workflows? Does it end up looking anything like a DITA topic or something like that, I guess? <laughs> <laughs> I wish, I wish. You know, it's it's really um, uh, funny and also quite remarkable that when I started out as a prompt designer, so writing instructions, I was like uber structured. And I mean, with prompting, it's very much also a, a matter of experimenting, very much hit or miss. And sometimes it feels like throwing a, a plate of spaghetti at the wall and see which ones stick and which ones don't. And I, I still remember the first time I was like, oh, forget it. I'm not going to structure my prompt. I'm just going to blurb in whatever I want it to get out of it. And, and it should just do the thing I want it to do. And that was actually my best prompt ever. So that was very confusing mm. for me. And then I started reading up on how prompts are processed by large language models. And I was utterly, utterly shocked to learn that they don't read. So they don't start at the top left and end at the right bottom. So you could easily put the introduction to your instructions at the end and the instructions in front, and you just throw everything at the model and somehow it understands. And this is something that is still mind blowing to me. Like it doesn't read, it doesn't that has read something, like we do. Yeah, so that has something to do with how the embeddings work and how it's vectorized, right? That, that it somehow can infer from mathematically. <laughs> It's it's basically how transformer models apparently work. You mm -hmm. just you just throw a lot of number distances at the model and like a little what is it called? Pinko, Plinko board? It just kind of falls oh, through. Yeah, yeah, like a pachinko board. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, wow. exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's and, a brilliant um, image. Yeah. Yeah. And then I realized that it's very important as a prompt designer to realize which kind of structure actually matters. Because structure in the sense of, oh, let's put in a numbered list. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, because that's how we humans read. But structure in the sense of chunking your instructions and keeping them separate from your examples and keeping them separate from your output, put your instructions at the end of the prompt rather than at the beginning or in the middle, because you know things tend to get lost in the middle. Um, it's a whole new world to discover in terms of What's the machine's kind of structure? What kind of structure do they like? That's right. So I'm guessing or inferring from what you just said, is there sort of a convention like like journalism writing or, or other kinds of writing where there's a, like the inverted pyramid in journalism, like in prompt construction, mm -hmm. is it like, okay, here's the setup, here's what we're going to talk about. And then at the very end, you say, and based on this, I want you to do this. Is that sort of what's yeah. going on? 
Absolutely. It's um, there, there's a very kind of classic structure emerging for, for prompts, which starts by assigning the large language model a role because the large language model in itself is it's nothing, right? It's an amorphous blob. And it's up to us to kind of carve a role, an identity, a, a personality even uh, for it. Um, so I usually start by saying something like, you're an expert technical writer. And your role is or your task is blah, 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 blah. And that's interesting because this way you already delimit the prompt that you're designing to one task. And of course, that too is very nice in terms of technical communication because one task equals one topic, uh, reference information, examples, it's all there in my prompt as well. So role, task, a little bit of context and sometimes I even explain it, the problem that I'm trying to solve, because then you kind of prime the model for getting into the same problem space. And this is kind of magical, I think, still. Yeah, that's um, a, yeah. The, the way you're describing it, it's like because these large, the, the L, the first L is large. These are giant models and they need some kind of context like, hey, in this vast amorphous um, vectorized embedding space. You are this entity, and I need you to do this right now. Yeah. But hey, yeah. I want to I want to circle back to something you said a few times sure. now sure. that you make the distinction between prompt design and prompt engineering. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that. Of course, yeah. Actually, it's it's a little bit of a framework I'm developing on the fly because people talk about prompting in all shapes and guises, and I actually have three levels of prompting. The first one is what I call conversational prompting, and that's what what everybody does with ChatGPT, with Bard and Bing. It's it's typically in a commercial end user app, so Bard ChatGPT. It's typically for personal use and entertainment no need to reuse your prompts a lot. Um, and it's um, very much on the, uh, it, well, the, the interface is conversational. So it's basically talking to a, a general knowledge chatbot that can also help you with all kinds of tasks. But it's up to you to kind of think up what you want to do, what you want to solve, and how you're going to phrase that. Then on the other end of the spectrum is the what I call the prompt engineer. And these are typically machine learning people or developers who build these commercial apps on top of a large language model. Um, and they are typically also the ones that connect with all kinds of APIs and backend systems and do a lot of like um, actual interface design, but also uh, make sure that these apps are deployed. Um, so uh, LLM ops is typically their kind of realm. And I do find myself exactly in the middle. I don't work with ChatGPT as my design environment. I usually uh, use a playground for that. And that gives me access to way more parameters and configuration options than you have in ChatGPT. But what I do is designing the prompt. So I do the, uh, the use case analysis, domain analysis, user analysis, much like um, a business analyst almost. And what I do is I design the prompt in a very free form way. So I don't bother with output formats like should it be JSON, should it be tables? Well, I do that like under the hood. But base, my focus is on making sure that the prompt meets user requirements. And for that, I write. So I don't code officially. I do code as a hobby. But my main focus is on writing a prompt that is effective, is robust. And then I hand it over to my prompt engineer because I'm so lucky now. I actually work in a team of more than one person. So I have a developer right next to me, Marco, and he's the one who says, OK, it's a great prompt, but how do you want to deploy it? Um, should it be like a standalone prompt? Is it part of what we call a prompt chain where you have like the output of one prompt is the input for the next one? And then he's the one that makes sure that it works in the code that it's tested, that, um, you know, regression tests and stuff like that happen. So he's the, 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 the one that implements it in actual applications. And that's very familiar to people who've done other kinds of design around software products, uh, yes. th that relationship. And it's it's kind of been interesting that like the same thing happens in, we kind of know each other also from the knowledge graph world. And in that mm -hmm. world, it's all ontology engineering all the time. There's no ontology designers anywhere. And I'm like, come on, you guys. And so I might steal your idea and try to carve out an ontology design role in that world. Yeah, especially yeah. because, because well, I love that you're, you're touching on ontologies because graphs and LLMs together 
well, they're well, I wouldn't call them a match made in heaven yet, but they are definitely mm -hmm. a combination that provides the best of both worlds because what LLMs can't do is, and I should be precise here, they can't do a logical inference. They do statistical inference all the time because that's how large language models work, but causal relationships and prompting for them consistently is just something that we cannot do with large language models. So that means that in order to have a persistent reference to the outside world or a model of the outside world, that's where graphs come in. And those relationships, of course, are persistent and queryable. Um, we're going kind of way into the deep end here, but I still yeah. see a very well, it's, it's also very topical, though, because uh, I'm sure you're following um, Dean Alamang and Juan Cicada's research mm -hmm. around the, uh, mm -hmm. the incorporate, like how much knowledge graphs can help LLMs um, in uh, not just retrieval argument, but just in general, like yeah. uh, that applying that paradigm. So that's, yeah, it's, um, and you are, this is why I wanted you on the show. You are so deep into this. You're like, you must be light years ahead of most people in this well how do how do you keep up how there's so much going on and you're <laughs> you're doing it day to day how do you both practice at the leading edge of this and get yourself to where you're ready to do that i am very particular in what i choose to keep up with um so i i always when i'm in doubt i always revert back to first order principles do i understand the underlying principles of a technology then i don't need to learn 20 different platforms that do the same thing. So, um, and the thing is, I mean, I've never actually built a full-blown ontology myself because I find RDF and OWL too difficult, but I understand the conceptual thinking that goes on. So I'm now even at the stage where I prompt my large language model to imitate a graph or to imitate the behavior of a graph uh, to make these like little... Um, impromptu, almost like, I call them ALIs, application language interfaces. So at places where APIs are kind of too structured, I build an, an ALI. <laughs> but uh, keeping up, yeah, I spend each morning, I spend one hour reading. And it might surprise you, but I'm actually reading up on, on classical rhetoric and conversation analysis. Um, and I do find that somehow that kind of transfers to the knowledge I need to do this work. Um, and uh, I try not to get too overwhelmed. I'm like, well, I mean, we're in a bubble, but I know so many people that haven't even used ChatGPT right now uh, that I'm not too worried about, oh, sh should I keep up? Oh, well, I mean, <laughs> I've, yeah, I also have like a life and I love walking outside and talking with friends. Um, so, but yeah, and I, I guess I'm blessed with a very kind of, well, you can notice it here as well. My, my head is not linear. So I just, sometimes I just go for a walk and I come back with a whole set of new connections. Um, I guess that's just a blessing and a curse at the same time. But right now it's mostly a blessing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's where I get all my best ideas. Well, the shower and walks, those are the yes, two absolutely, yeah. of ideas. <laughs> that's where and, and I must say, walks, I used to walk with a little voice recorder, um, but nowadays I do my walking with chat GPT in voice mode. And that is, that is actually mind blowing. I have not tried. I use Otter when I'm out walking, but I might uh -huh. have to try chat. I didn't. Yeah, that makes. Yeah, that makes a lot of. Well, sense. the thing is, the thing is that with, with with talking to Chat GPT, you can actually tell it to shut up for like I don't know twenty minutes or until you say so. So you can just ramble, and then when you're done, I tell it, "Hey, Chat, listen. I'm always very polite to Chat because well, you never know when the large language models want to take revenge, right? But I'm like, okay, this is me talking." Now, could you perhaps help me by doing, and I just give it a task, like, can you give a transcript of my notes? Can you um, highlight um, some of the uh, more important ones? Or, And it's the actual conversation that I'm having. Half of the time, I'm not even listening to what it gives back. But I do know that when I come home and I log in on my text chat GPT, everything is there. And I also know that something has been listening and something listening or something in listening mode is just an invitation to keep talking. So um, that's how I do most of the drafting for most of my articles. 
I never let it write the final version because I hate ChatGPT's tone of voice with a vengeance. <laughs> Even if I train it on my own tone of voice, it's it's this song by Tom Waits. It's it's the wrong smile in the wrong face, though her lips are smiling, it's not her face. And that, that's exactly how I feel about ChatGPT. Okay, it's nice text, but it's not me. <laughs> I'm going to try to link to that Tom Waits song in the show notes. That's too great. Hey, Mike, I'll, I can't I'll believe. Willing. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Yeah, hey, I can't believe it. I could literally talk to you forever about this stuff. But I, I like to, um, uh, part of my conversation analysis is folks have let me know that a half hour is a good time. So I try to keep yeah. these around that. But hey, before we wrap, though, is there anything last, anything that you want to make sure you share with folks before we wrap or that's come up in the conversation that you? Yes, for anyone, any writer out there who's worried about their future. Um, I have this really, well, it's kind of a lame final last words, but they are mine, not chat GPT. Let me quote them from my own slide. The future is bright for those who know how to write. We'll always be needed. And I think now even more than ever. Nice. That's a perfect note to end on. Oh, one very last thing, Micah. Um, what's the best way for folks to stay in touch if they want to connect? And you have to mention Convo Club because I want to make sure people know about that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do have a, a small community of linguists, language lovers, conversation designers, tech writers. And that's at www.convo.club. And I have my virtual living room at LinkedIn. So my LinkedIn profile is Maike Groenewegen, written uh, as one word, but I'm sure that a link will work much better. But LinkedIn is literally where I hang out all day. So uh, that's where you can find me. Also, um, conference season is coming up. I'm definitely there at Edinburgh in March. I'm there in uh, Copenhagen in April. And of course, unparsed in June. And I mean, all these communities are wonderful. Uh, so if you get a chance and want to meet in real life, this is definitely something to, to look out for. Excellent. I'll link to those events as well, because I'm, I'm going to try to get to at least one or two of those. Um, Lovely. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Micah. It's always so fun My to talk pleasure. to you. My absolute pleasure. And um, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been great sharing some thoughts with like-minded people again. So thank you so much. For show notes and to sign up for our newsletter, visit our website at contentandai.com. And please rate and review us on your favorite podcast platform. Thanks for listening.